Now, you, you're likely to see these, so you might see this as part of a big protein problem, but you also could see this as just a, a single predict the products problem. And notice, this doesn't have to be used on a normal amino acid. This could be, you could do total acid hydrolysis on anything, as long as it's got hydrolyzable bonds. So it could be used on a normal peptide or on anything that's got hydrolyzable bonds. Just a regular old amino acid. That's right. But or even an for, ester. Anything that can be hydrolyzed. Could it just be anything? Like yeah. Acid Actually, or? this would be used for amide bonds. If he, okay. if he writes it like this, like a total acid hydrolysis, this would be for amide bonds. Okay. That's right. All right. Okay. All right. So this is one of the techniques we use in analyzing peptides, along with many others. What's the, the marking thing? That's right. coming later. Well, maybe we can get to that now. Let me see what my notes are. There's like, what's next? There's deciphering C terminus and terminus analysis. Okay. We have that. Okay, so we need to say two more things here for total acid hydrolysis. You need to know that total acid, so remember that the, the goal here is we're going to hydrolyze the peptide, so then we can analyze what amino acids it was made out of. However, there's a problem. The problem is that total acid hydrolysis destroys some amines. It destroys tryptophan and cysteine. We need to know that total acid hydrolysis would destroy tryptophan and cysteine so they wouldn't show up as part of the peptide. And, and, and what? Cysteine? Cysteine. We just need to have this memorized. Tryptophan and cysteine are destroyed by total acid hydrolysis. So they will not show up as having been part of the peptide if you treat it with total acid hydrolysis. So what do we do with that? Well, that will just be one of the clues that we have to take into account if we have time today to see how to do a, a peptide degradation problem. So this is something we'll have to keep in the back of our mind. Um, one thing this means is, so after you do total acid hydrolysis, you should say, gee, I know these are the amino acids that the peptide was made out of, except maybe there was also tryptophan and cysteine. You have to keep in mind that after you do a total acid hydrolysis, there could have also been tryptophan and cysteine. They may have been right? okay. Now, here's a more concrete way to look at this. Let's look at asparagine and glutamine. Oh, we already did. Why did I erase that? So we already here did a total acid hydrolysis on asparagine, right? And what did we get? All right, this is the total acid hydrolysis that we just did. Did I get that right? Okay, so let's say that we have this tripeptide. We do the total acid hydrolysis, and then we run this through the computer, and the computer will tell us what the amino acids are that we were made out of. So what, will, what amino acid will the computer say this was? Glutamine. Because it will detect the side chain. And what amino acid will the computer say this was? So this is lysine. So we'll know that the so we'll know that the original molecule had lysine in it in the glycine. But when the computer looks at this, what will the computer say this is? This should be under the acid-containing functionalities at the bottom of your table. Aspartic acid. Yeah. The computer will say this is aspartic acid. And then, if we're naive, we will think that the original peptide had aspartic acid. Mm -hmm. But it didn't. What did the original peptide have? It had asparagine. Wait, what's the second one? Then? This is the second one. Oh, Sorry? Oh. Oh, because we, we already know what it did have. Okay. So it, this is unrealistic because in this situation, we're imagining we know what the original peptide is and we're predicting what we would get from total acid hydrolysis. But when you're really in a lab, all you see are the products of the total acid hydrolysis and you have to use those as clues to what the original starting material was. This is all, all a big detective story. Well, the computer will tell us that we've got aspartic acid. However, we have to say to ourselves, gee, that could have come from asparagine. I think I pointed out to you guys a little bit earlier that it's very easy to confuse aspartic acid and asparagine, and glutamic acid and glutamine. 
if you look at those in your table, notice how similar aspartic acid and asparagine are. Well, I have them on the board right here. So aspartic acid has one carbon and an amide group. And aspar I'm sorry, asparagine has one carbon and an amide group. And aspartic acid has one carbon and a carboxy group. Mm -hmm. So it's easy to confuse them. Notice what happened here. We started with asparagine, but asparagine has an amide bond, and the amide gets destroyed by the total acid hydrolysis. So the key thing is, not only does total acid hydrolysis break up the peptide, it also turns asparagine into aspartic acid. The upshot is that total acid hydrolysis turns the asparagine into aspartic acid. So ASN to ASP. That's right. That's something that heart shouldn't really need to be memorized. We can see that from our understanding of total acid hydrolysis. If we look at asparagine in the table, it has an amide group. So we know that the total acid hydrolysis will turn that amide group into a carboxy group. And that's the aspartic acid group. That was lysine. That was no trouble. The computer will say, gee, this is lysine, and we really did start with lysine. The interesting one is the aspartic acid here. Again, the computer will say, you have aspartic acid. However, we need to know that that might have come from aspartic acid, or it might have come from asparagine. Mm -hmm. And we risk the problems of perhaps tryptophan and cis. But in this case, not, because we have three and three, right? That's right. So nothing could have That's right. Also, you can oftentimes count how many amino acids you got, and you know how many you started with. So that way you can kind of tell whether there's any Im missing amino acids. That's one way to see whether any tryptophan or cysteine got destroyed. If you have fewer amino acids after the total acid hydrolysis than before, you know you probably have some tryptophan or cysteine in there. But let's put that aside and focus on this issue here. So what we're seeing here is, how can I summarize this? Let's say that you start with asparagine and you do a total acid hydrolysis. What would the asparagine look like after the total acid hydrolysis? It'll look like aspartic acid. On the other hand, suppose you start with aspartic acid and you do a total acid hydrolysis. Well, obviously, that would also look like aspartic acid after the total acid hydrolysis. So the upshot is, remember that in real life, all that we see is this. All we see is what we have after the total acid hydrolysis, and then we have to figure out the starting materials. So this is a difficulty for us. It means if the total acid hydrolysis produces aspartic acid, then what we have to say in our notes is maybe the original peptide had an asparagine, or maybe it had an aspartic acid. So far, we can't tell which one, because either of those would present, so to speak, as aspartic acid after the total acid hydrolysis. And that should make very good sense based on their structures. This has an amide bond that gets hydrolyzed into a carboxy group over here. Okay. And now let's look at glutamic acid and glutamine. And you'll see that they have the same exact difficulty. Can you find glutamic acid and glutamine in your table? So that's why you were pointing them out before, I think. So here's the glutamine. Okay. If you look at your table, you'll see this is the correct structure for glutamine. Okay. Then it keeps going. Presumably it would be attached to other peptides, but we don't care about those here. Now let's say we do a total acid hydrolysis. Well, glutamine has an amide side chain. So that's going to be hydrolyzed. And after the hydrolysis, it's not going to have an amide side chain anymore. It's going to have a carboxylic acid side chain. And now it doesn't look like glutamine anymore. Now the computer thinks it's glutamic acid, GLU. If you look at the table, you'll see this is the structure for glutamic acid, and this is the structure for glutamine. And what about that side chain that just hydrolyzed? That side chain. Oh, sorry. TAH, go up, please. Uh, where the, yeah, that one. 
well, this is another amino acid that's not interesting to us. Presumably that would be cut off as well. All I'm trying to do here is point out what happens to glutamine when you do a total acid hydrolysis. Shouldn't that be an OH? Down the bottom, NH3 plus. Yeah, You're right, I'm wrong. Yeah, that's where I went. Looks like I got confused. That's right. So here we're hydrolyzing this amide bond. That's right. So I should have turned this amide bond into an OH. You're right. So then this should be an alpha carbon. I should keep labeling the alpha carbons. So the point we're trying to make is that just like asparagine gets hydrolyzed to look like aspartic acid, glutamine also gets hydrolyzed to look like glutamic acid. So if you hydrolyze glutamic acid, it looks like glutamic acid. But if you hydrolyze glutamine, it also looks like glutamic acid. These two are basically the same pattern here.